and uh, welcome to this symposium on the past, present, and future of nuclear energy, marking the 35th anniversary of the accident at Three Mile Island. Uh, I first of all want to begin by thanking uh, my collaborators, uh, Dean Joe Helbley of the Thayer School, where we are now comfortably seated, and Dan Riker, uh, distinguished Dartmouth graduate and the head of the uh, Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance at Stanford University. And despite last night's uh, loss to Dayton, uh, we're glad, we're really glad. This is a victory for Stanford to be here, and we're thrilled that you are here, Dan. Um, my my 12-year-old insisted I watch that with him. Um, but uh, anyway, I want to. Uh, I also want to thank all of our panelists who've traveled from uh, from near and some from very far to join us here today for this uh, important event. Many have asked me why uh, the Dickey Center, Dartmouth's focal point for international affairs, would be interested in a uh, in, in collaborating on a conference on nuclear energy. And uh, my guess is that to everyone in the room, the answers uh, are all quite clear, but I think they're worth uh, enumerating. The first of all is, of course, there's nothing more important to the wealth and health of nations uh, than a uh, uh, ample supply of energy. That much is clear, and I say that on a day that I believe President Obama is meeting with uh, the King of Saudi Arabia, a country with which we don't share too many values, but share an enormous and overriding interest in the free flow of, uh, of oil from uh, the Persian Gulf, and also at a time when energy is front and center in the discussions over how to react to Russia's annexation of Crimea. I don't think we could ask for more uh, uh, dramatic displays of the importance of energy in international affairs. The second reason is, of course, uh, the high priority that the international community has put on climate change. And uh, according to at least one statistic that I read recently, uh, if we are going to avoid hitting that uh, two degree mark, two degree change mark that uh, worries everyone so much, something like 80% of hydrocarbons need to stay underneath the ground. And therefore, it's vitally important that we ask the question of whether uh, and which um, uh, low or no carbon footprint energy sources uh, are there to be exploited and, to, and promoted more. And finally, uh, the third reason is that when there are uh, ac nuclear accidents of a significant nature, ones that certainly dwarf Three Mile Island, such as Chernobyl and Fukushima, they stress the international system uh, greatly. Uh, it took many, many years, uh, and Dan will know more about this than I do, to actually wind up Chernobyl and to get the international funding and support to take care of that. Uh, take care of that set of reactors. And if there is going to be uh, uh, new departures in uh, nuclear energy around the world, it's going to require uh, improved international systems for dealing with uh, any potential accidents. I think all these reasons are more than enough to justify uh, this conference, and I think that this is exactly the right time to have it. So again, I want to thank you for joining us, and I look forward to a very interesting and stimulating day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Greetings, President Hanlon, and good morning to all of you. I'm so pleased to be here this morning at Dartmouth, my, my alma mater, representing the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance a joint center of the Stanford Law and Business Schools. For better or worse, I came up with the idea for this symposium last fall. I'd recently come across my materials from the President's Commission on the accident at Three Mile Island and realized that March 28, 2014, today, was the 35th anniversary of the Pennsylvania accident. I wrote President Hanlon suggesting that Dartmouth mark the anniversary with a symposium. And to make a long story short, here we are today with lots of hard work by many in this room. But the real reason we're here today at Dartmouth is John Kemeny. He was a remarkable man, Hungarian refugee, research assistant for Albert Einstein, Manhattan Project scientist, eminent mathematician, co-inventor of the computer language basic, and of course, Dartmouth president. You'll hear stories from folks who knew him well, including President Hanlon. I have two quick ones. First. 
Not long after President Kemeny was named chair of the Three Mile Island Commission by President Carter, I decided this was my chance to go to Washington. I was finishing my senior year here at Dartmouth. I thought maybe I'll write President Kemeny a letter. You students remember what letters are, right? <laughs> but I thought, what the heck, maybe I'll just stand in the president's parking place behind Parkhurst. It was a cold day and I shuffled around trying to stay warm. President Kemeny finally emerged and was walking quickly toward his little blue Fiat, puffing his ever-present cigarette when I popped the question. To be honest, I can't remember his precise words, but they weren't exactly encouraging. So I phoned my mom. She said, if you really want a job, you better get down to Washington. In DC, I'd knocked on the door of the commission and mentioned that I'd spoken to President Kemeny. <laughs> The personnel folks also weren't exactly encouraging, but as I headed out, one of them said, you know, we do need someone to run the Xerox machine. <laughs> I didn't hesitate, I'll take it, I said. Three weeks into the job, I was bleary-eyed watching that infernal light go back and forth for 10 hours a day. I stuck my head in the door of the commission's general counsel's office and said, sir, I'm a Dartmouth graduate and I know how to read. <laughs> Anything I can do for you? The gruff general counsel took a chance, and I was elevated to legal assistant. The lesson, shoot high, but not too high. <laughs> a second John Kemeny story starts for me with Ari Coppell, a Dartmouth 15, who has been combing the Dartmouth archives for Kemeny and Three Mile Island materials. Ari heard a wonderful Kemeny story, but we couldn't determine whether it was anything more than apocryphal. I happened to mention the story to my dear friend, classmate and former business partner, Scott Brown. I'll let Scott take it from there. In a note, he wrote, I had dinner with President Kemeny three or four times after we graduated when I would come back up to Hanover. On one occasion, he described how he started at Los Alamos. He had been working at Princeton for a short time after immigrating. The Defense Department recruited him to work on the Manhattan Project and gave him travel instructions to Los Alamos after his security checks had been completed. They gave him tickets to Santa Fe with additional instructions to wait on a certain corner outside a coffee shop for an unmarked bus that would pick him up and take him to the Los Alamos lab. He was not to speak to anyone about his destination or his employer. His entire mission was top secret and he should not divulge details to anyone. He arrived in Santa Fe and went to the designated street to wait for the bus. He was an hour early, but didn't want to miss the bus, so he waited on the corner. After 20 minutes or so, a waitress came out of the coffee shop and said, Mister, if you're waiting for the bus to the secret lab, you're on the wrong corner. <laughs> <laughs> Go wait over there. <laughs> with that, let me recognize some folks without whom we wouldn't be here at Dartmouth today. First and foremost, our illustrious panelists and keynoters who have come from far and wide to impart their wisdom. They will not all agree today, and their differences may be striking, but that was our intent. Nuclear power stirs deep passion, but it's a significant power source in the U.S. and globally, and it is being given a second look by many, particularly because of its carbon-free nature. Our speakers and your questions will help size up its potential. Second, let me recognize and thank my symposium co-chairs, Thayer Dean Joe Helbley and Dickey Center Director Dan Benjamin, and also the unflappable Tom Candon, the day-to-day -day organizer of today's event. Where are you, Tom? Thank you very much. Third, let me recognize all of you for spending your Friday with us. I'm hopeful you'll find it worthwhile. I urge you to approach the day with a willingness to listen, learn, and ask hard but respectful questions. And finally, I have to recognize my dear daughter, Haley Riker, a freshman, she's up there, <laughs> whose proud dad can't help but note that she had the lead role in the recent production of Spring Awakening at the Hopkins Center. <laughs> more on that later. And far more importantly, Haley recently rolled a kayak on a cold whitewater river in North Carolina on the Ledyard Canoe Club spring trip. And Haley, don't worry, I will not reveal your nickname in front of this august crowd, but you owe me. <laughs> <laughs>
with that, let me turn things over to Dean Joe Helbley of Dartmouth's Thayer School of Engineering. Thank you. Thank you, Dan and Dan, and let me add my thanks to all of you for joining us here this morning. I'll be very brief so we can get this morning's uh, intellectual proceedings underway. The Thayer School of Engineering um, has chosen over the past seven or eight years energy as one of two core areas of focus, intellectual activity, and faculty and programmatic growth. As part of that, every spring for the past five years, we've hosted a symposium that focuses on great issues in energy. We've looked at things like climate change, we've looked at energy policy with the Secretary of Energy visiting us a few years ago, we've looked at intermittency and the challenges of the contemporary electric grid in dealing with renewable sources, and we're very pleased to join with the Steyer Taylor Center from Stanford and the Dickey Center in co-hosting this symposium today. I don't have a John Kemeny story, but there is a brief Thayer connection to the events at Three Mile Island that not many people, including not many of the Thayer faculty and staff, are aware of that I'd like to, to mention. In the long, nearly 150-year history of the Thayer School of Engineering, there is one alumnus, one engineering alumnus, who has been elected to and served in the United States Congress, and that was Alan Ertle. Dartmouth class of 1958, Thayer and Tuck class of 1959. It turns out that Congressman Ertle was elected to Congress in the House of Representatives, representing the district in central Pennsylvania where Three Mile Island sat, and he was the member representing that district at the time of the accident. Now, I've subsequently met him in the course of my conversations with alumni that I'm privileged to have as part of this job. And we had a long conversation about the benefits at that moment in time, in that place, of having a technical background and being able to translate between the investigation, the investigators, the media, his constituents, and present an unbiased but understandable view of what was happening. And so Thayer, in a small way, in the School of Engineering here at Dartmouth, played an important role in understanding what happened at that point in time. With that, let me simply conclude by saying it's a priv privilege and a pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker this morning, and that is Dartmouth's 18th president, Philip J. Hanlon. President Hanlon, as many of you know, is a graduate of both Dartmouth and Caltech. After a brief postdoctoral fellowship at MIT, he did something that's unheard of in academic circles. He moved immediately to a tenured faculty position at the University of Michigan, where he spent a long and distinguished career as an academic, as a scholar, as a mathematician, as a teacher, and as a senior administrator. He came to us last June after serving as the provost at the University of Michigan and he has initiated many exciting new um, activities here at Dartmouth, including uh, a look at investing in our intellectual enterprise and building our faculty through clustered hiring and core intellectual areas. With that, let me step aside and introduce President Hanlon, our first speaker. Phil. technically ready. Uh, so uh, this is a great honor to be here and thanks to all of you for joining us for this exciting event. Uh, I especially of course want to thank the Dickey Center and the Thayer School and the Stanford Steyer Taylor Center for energy policy and finance and uh, also Dan for his leadership in pulling this all together and uh, you know Dan uh, has many many accomplishments uh, they all pale in comparison to Haley's performance uh, in Spring Awakening, which was just fantastic. So, uh, Haley, congratulations. I would also, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be talking about, uh, from a sort of personal connection, 
Uh, one of my heroes and most distinguished predecessors, John Kemeny, and I would like to point out that Jenny Kemeny is with us today. So, Jenny. <laughs> and I want to begin with a slide, if I can figure out how to advance this. Um, ah, there it is. So uh, this is a uh, document which exists in our Rauner Library historical collection. And uh, you know, I'm not going to explain in detail what this is, but there's one important thing you need to know, is that it's a, a derivation of a set of equations which was begun by Albert <laughs> Einstein and then corrected by John Kemeny. <laughs> so I offer this just so we can stipulate right at the start that these Dartmouth presidents, particularly those who are mathematicians, are really smart. <laughs> All right, so um, I, wa I, I want to begin my story uh, close, close to here, where, where Gail and I currently reside, 14 Webster Avenue. And a call that occurred on April 9th, 1979, at 10 p.m. And uh, John Kemeny was the president, residing there, and he uh, answered the phone, and it was the White House. Something, a call you don't get very often. And the call was to inform Kemeny that he was on the short list of candidates that was being submitted to the President of the United States for consideration to chair the President's Commission on the Accident at Three Mile Island. Now, uh, you know, no one is really prepared for a call from the White House, and so uh, he uh, admitted there was a certain heaviness to this moment, uh, and he ended the call with a request, which was, can I sleep on it? So in hindsight, that was poor choice of words because he reported later that he didn't sleep a wink that night. <laughs> But before going forward with the story, I'd like to step back. I'd like, I'd like to reset back to uh, uh, many years earlier. In 1940, John Kemeny escaped the Nazi occupation in Europe. Kemeny's family fled Budapest for New York City, and John entered high school knowing not a single word of English. Three years later, he graduated at the top of his class. He was accepted at Princeton, where he went on to study math mathematics. At age 18, having completed his freshman year, his first life-changing call came from Uncle Sam, not by way of a phone call, but by way of a letter. He was drafted into the Army and sent to Los Alamos as part of the Manhattan Project. Now, uh, in terms of serving the government, his role at Los Alamos was probably as far from commissioning a, uh, a panel as you could get. And in fact, Kemeny was one of 20 so-called computers. So these were young mathematicians that spent eight hours a day punching keys on an IBM bookkeeping calculator looking for numerical solutions to differential equations. This was tedious, uh, painstaking work, even for a mathematician. It took two or three weeks of eight-hour days, six days a week to just get one single result. So I mention this uh, in part because there's another historic anniversary coming up very soon. And that is that at 4 a.m. on May 1st, in a few weeks' time, we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of turning on the computer which supported BASIC. So that was the start of BASIC, the 50th anniversary of BASIC. And BASIC, uh, as you know, I probably know, was created by uh, John Kemeny and Tom Kurtz with an audacious vision, uh, a vision uh, that at that time was just hard to imagine. That is that computing should come to everybody. So computing should be something that every person does. And uh, indeed, when I attended Dartmouth in the 70s, uh, every undergraduate touched computers. And in speaking to my uh, friends that went to other places at the time, they were stunned that that was the case. So. Uh, as I said, this is the 50th anniversary of BASIC, and again, one of uh, John Kemeny's amazing pioneering feats. Um, in speaking of his time at Los Alamos, uh, John noted that in the 70s, one undergraduate working one afternoon using a time-sharing computer could work as many differential equations as the Los Alamos team did in a whole year. And there could be 100 other users on the computer at the same time. So that was where they were advanced to in the 70s. And of course, as we all know, we are light years ahead of that now. 
So in some sense, uh, as, Don, as Dan made the point, John Kennedy was present at the very inception of nuclear power as a tool and puts his, his later service on the Presidential Commission in a bit of fuller context. Returning to Princeton after the war at age 22, a year before he earned his PhD, so you can see he was sort of a fast mover through the academic world, um, John became Albert Einstein's mathematical assistant. Once asked why in the world Albert Einstein would need a mathematical assistant, John just smiled gently and said, well, Einstein wasn't very good at math, <laughs> as we see. <laughs> but John certainly was good at mathematics, and he went on to teach math and philosophy at Princeton until 1953, when Dartmouth was lucky to have him join the faculty here. And eventually, of course, you know the story. John became president of Dartmouth College in 1970 and served there until 1981. And his tenure would be notable for many, many things, uh, including Dartmouth's transition to coeducation, and of course, making Dartmouth the true pioneer of student computing. So let's go back now to uh, that night, April 9th, 1979, that sleepless night in the president's house. And uh, if John was a night owl to begin with, which he was, a call like that would, would ensure that he would see the sunrise wide awake and he and Jean did. The next morning he called David McLaughlin, who was then chair of the Board of Trustees, and discussed and reported on this potential uh, offer that he was going to get. And at the end of the conversation, McLaughlin told Kemeny, you know, look, we don't know if you're gonna get, be picked, but if that famous call comes saying that you are the man for the country for this important job, you're gonna forget all the cons and you're gonna say, yes, Mr. President. And of course, the very next morning, just such a call came asking if John could be at the White House by 4 p.m. And just as McLaughlin predicted, the answer was, yes, Mr. President, followed by, is it possible to get from Hanover to Washington by 4 p.m.? <laughs> <laughs> the answer was yes, but just barely. He arrived at eight minutes to four. And so that was the whirlwind selection process. Uh, John was officially appointed at 4 p.m., handed a charter of the Presidential Commission, which gave the chairman broad and substantial powers, virtually all the powers of a federal department head, including broad subpoena authority. And he was sent off to work with the 11 other commissioners selected by the president. <laughs> by 4.15, he held his first press conference announcing the commission, and then the real work began. And the commission had an ambitious charge, a multi-pronged approach to understanding the many facets of the accident. It examined the sequence of events to determine what happened and why, to evaluate equipment failures and the importance of various actions or inactions on the part of individuals and organizations. The commission analyzed radiation releases and came up with the best possible estimates of the health effects of the accident on the workers and the general public as well as what the health impact might have been if the accident had been more severe. They conducted an in-depth examination of the role played by the utility and its primary suppliers. They looked especially closely at the training given the operators and the procedures at their disposal. At the request of the president, the commission looked at the efficacy of emergency plans in place by way of the utility, state, and local government and federal authorities. They examined media coverage of the accident, trying to sort out whether errors in media accounts were due to ignorance or confusion on the part of official sources or the reporters themselves. Unfortunately, they didn't have social media they had to deal with. <laughs> and finally, the commission spent a great deal of time on the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They tried to understand the complex structure of the NRC, how well it functioned, its role in licensing, rulemaking, inspection, enforcement, and monitoring. So taken together, this was indeed a monumental task. They took more than 150 de depositions and interviewed a much larger set of people. They amassed 300 linear feet of shelf space in, now housed in the National Archives. It's also important to note what the commission did not do. They did not examine the entire nuclear energy industry. 
or the military applications of nuclear energy. They did not evaluate the relative risks. They did not attempt to reach a conclusion about the subsequent development of commercial nuclear power. John and his fellow commissioners felt very strongly that their charge was to look at the accident in all its complexity in order to improve the safety of existing and planned nuclear power plants. A limited scope, perhaps, but already enormously challenging. This, they viewed, would be the proper discharge of their responsibilities, and in a larger sense, the proper legacy of the Three Mile Island accident. So I will leave it to you and your debates today to uh, consider the relative merits of the Commission's work. I can tell you that the public reception to the report was very positive, and Dartmouth supported its president in devoting a brief part of his tenure to national service. And on a more personal note, I think it's important to remember that John wasn't a nuclear power expert when he agreed to lead the commission. And he would likely not consider himself an expert when their work was concluded. And he would be the first to admit as such. He understood that it's important in leadership to be aware of your limitations, what you're not expert at. And I can report, as Dartmouth president, that if you ever forget this lesson, there are people constantly here to remind you of how little you know. So. But that's not what the President of the United States was looking for in a commission chair. He wanted a towering, respected intellect who could work through the multifaceted problems. And though he made no pretense of being a nuclear expert, knowing a little something about the intellectual curiosity of John Kemeny and his passion for complex problems, I can, I suspect, I am sure, that his learning curve took off like a rocket. More importantly, John represented something innately and by example that we still aspire to imbue in every young graduate who leaves Dartmouth today. And that's citizen leadership. The passion, the skills, the wisdom to impact the complex challenges facing mankind. He demonstrated that in spades. John served as a great example that it's the power of the intellect, the ability to integrate and apply all you know from a variety of disciplines towards a complex problem that's, that is, in fact, the most powerful tool a citizen leader can bring to bear against any number of vexing problems facing mankind. And I have to believe that at least a portion of the Commission's success was due to its chairman, chairman's natural abilities and his passion as a teacher, one who seeks to communicate knowledge John said he took the job making only two promises. First, that he would tell the truth. And second, that he would produce a report that someone could read. <laughs> he recounted proudly how, after the report's release, he was approached by two senators, one Democrat and one Republican. And he went on at length in praise of the commission's work and then told the chairman that in their many years of service to the US Congress, so this was the first report they'd ever received which was written in English. <laughs> I suspect that made John Kemeny, the chairman and the teacher, very pleased. And just as he would be pleased that the lessons learned from Three Mile Island, lessons he pursued with great intellectual honesty, are still relevant to larger issues in the field of nuclear power today and going forward. I'm certain he would tell us that there are lessons yet to be learned and he would be proud of this gathering here today. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. And please enjoy the discussions going forward. So thank you.